Hello and welcome to lecture 51 of my class from Data to Decisions. I'm Chris Mack. And here we're going to talk about some techniques for addressing multi collinearity. There's going to be a major technique we'll talk about in a future lecture called principal component analysis, but we'll talk about some other techniques uh, in this lecture. So, what are the main ways of dealing with multicollinearity once we've detected it? In the last lecture, we talked about how to detect it. Now we find out we have some. What do we do? Well, one thing is to decide whether we care. If we don't care about the model coefficients and interpreting their meaning, we only care about using the model to make predictions, then we can use our model even though it has multicollinearity. We just have to make sure that we restrict the scope of the model and using it make predictions so that it coincides with the data we use to actually generate uh, our model uh, so that only working within the realm of the data where the same pattern of multicollinearity exists. Um, if that's the case, we can just use the model as it is and say about it. Be very careful not to go outside of the true scope of the model. Another thing, if we have uh, some very high variance inflation factors for some variables, or say one variable, multiple variables, we can simply decide to get rid of those variables from our model. After all, if we have a very high variance inflation factor, that means one of the variables is highly correlated with the other predictor variables. And if we drop that, then we still have most of the same information present in the remaining predictor variables. So we begin by dropping uh, the, the variable with the highest VIF, if it's very high, and see how well our model performs then, and see if most of the multicollinearity problems have disappeared. This is probably the most common solution. Um, when I've got plenty of predictive variables and one of them has a very high VIF. Sometimes we can add data. Uh, we can look in the data space in regions where we don't have any data today, add some new data that might break the multicollinearity. I'll talk about that in, in the next slide. Uh, it can be a very powerful way when it's possible to do this. It, it's also possible, if I have two highly correlated parameters, that I can measure the coefficient of that parameter in some separate experiment. And once I determine what that coefficient is, uh, I fix it and then drop that variable from the model by using it as a uh, fixed um, part of the model, so a fixed parameter, but not a, a parameter where I try to use the data to calibrate it. Um, this, this can be a very useful way. It's similar to adding more data, but it's it, it could be that I, I get at the value of this coefficient by some uh, separate experiment, or maybe even by looking up a value uh, in a in a book, for example, if if that parameter is a physical parameter that I can I can uh, find some other way. Uh, remember that if I have multicollinearity, then uh, the the values of of two or more parameters that allow a good fit of the data become ex uh, extremely wide range. And so by fixing one of them, it allows me to um, break that collinearity. Two techniques that are more statistical in nature, one is the ridge regression, I'll talk about that in this lecture, and the other is principal component analysis, which will be our main technique. If we want to use a regression technique to deal with high levels of multicollinearity, the principal component analysis will be the technique that I recommend. I'll talk about that in a future lecture. Today we'll talk about ridge regression. First, adding data. Here's a set of data that shows a highly uh, correlated predictor variables. We've seen this data before. And notice that we don't have any data in regions uh, of this. And as a result, because there's no data there, I, I see high correlation between these two um, uh, measures. Now, the question is, is there no data there because we simply failed to collect it? Or is there no data there because data doesn't exist? In other words, uh, is this an apparent high level of correlation between these two? Or does the population, does the, the true nature of, of these two measurements dictate that there must be high levels of correlation? 
the very, very uh, big difference between those two. And you have to uh, actually go out and look at the data or look at your uh, population to decide whether that's true. If it's possible to collect data in these regions, then you will break the correlation in your model because uh, out here you'll have high value of one parameter and low value of another. Uh, and so they won't be correlated any longer in your model. All right, that's a very great technique for doing, uh, getting rid of multicolarity only if it's possible. There is an interesting technique, and we won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but we'll spend a little bit of time just so you're familiar with it, a, a, a technique called ridge regression. This is a purely statistical technique, a trick, so to speak, uh, to help you break this um, multicollinearity by adding some bias to your estimators of the parameters. Um, that bias can reduce uncertainty in the coefficients, the standard errors of those coefficients, uh, at the expense of adding a little bit of bias. What we do is we take our normal sum of square errors um, calculation. So this is the residuals of my model squared. So the data minus, minus the model. Residual squared, we sum all those up, and that's normally uh, the, the, the thing we try to minimize with our maximum likelihood estimator. But now I'm going to add a penalty. What's the penalty? The penalty will be the sum of the coefficients squared multiplied by some empirical factor k. Um, some textbooks use the letter lambda. I'll use k here. So this penalty will bias our results. How will it bias them? Well, you can see it, pen it penalizes for large magnitude of the coefficients. So it's going to try to push these coefficients to be smaller in magnitude. We have to be a little bit careful because, you know, uh, different units of predictor variables, I can get very different magnitudes of my coefficients, betas. So we generally scale and center or standardize our data before we perform ridge regression. That also has the effect of, of making the uh, intercept go to zero. Penalty uh, excludes the intercept uh, from the penalty. All right, let's talk about it, bridge regression, uh, from the perspective of how you might do this. Well, in R, we've got some standard ridge regression uh, routines that we just run them and we model it just like we might uh, any other way. We can do a ridge regression in Excel, though. Uh, a little trick. What we do is we add some fake data to the bottom. So we've got, you know, n data points. We're going to add p minus 1 new rows to our standardized data. Um, for the y values, I'll set them all equal to 0. And for the x values, I will have all of them 0 except uh, 1 a point. Um, and for that value, I'll stick in the square root of k. Uh, so each row will have 1. Uh, x value that's square root of k and the other ones will all be zero and then a different one for the next row and a different one for the next row kind of like a diagonal and that's what this uh, represents uh, a diagonal of values equal to the square root of k once you've got that you now do a standard p squares regression with um, this number of uh, uh, data points these extra data points added uh, but by far, the easiest way to do it will be to use uh, uh, R or something like that, because the hardest part is going to be picking this value of K. We're going to have to iterate through some values of K to see what we want to do. How do we pick K? How do we pick this ridge coefficient? Well, one way is to create what's called a ridge trace. That is, uh, you vary K, and then you do a best fit uh, for each value of K. And then watch how the coefficients vary. K. Uh, K will, as K gets bigger, uh, these these uh, coefficients will start to level off, and and so it'll change rapidly at first, then they'll level off, and we look for the smallest value of K where it's starting to level off. It's kind of a judgment thing, uh, sometimes not so easy. Uh, another approach is to use a validation data set. 
and find the value of k that minimizes the validation sum of square errors. Uh, we haven't really talked about different ways of doing validation yet. We will in the future lectures, but this is probably the most common way that people use today. They'll, they'll take a little bit of the data out, calibrate the rest of the model, not using that data, and then validate the model against that subset of the data and uh, see how it works. To find the k that minimizes this validation sum of square errors. Some properties of this ridge regression, as I said, it's biased. The coefficients are biased to be smaller in magnitude, but they will have smaller variance if you do a good job of picking the k. Now, if k goes to zero, then of course the ridge regression just becomes an ordinary least squares regression. And as k gets larger, I'm going to be pushing all the coefficients of the ridge regression down to zero because of that penalty of the values of the parameter square. If I had an orthonormal design matrix, that is, if I had data such that every single parameter, every single predictive variable was orthogonal to all the others, had no correlations whatsoever between them, then we would find that the ridge regression coefficients were equal to the ordinary least squares regression coefficient divided by 1 plus k. So you can see that what we're doing is shrinking the values of the coefficients. One of the advantages of a ridge regression is if we had really, really strong multicollinearity, we can get into a situation where the OLS solution just doesn't exist. But for even for perfect multicollinearity, where I can't do an ordinary least squares regression, I can do a ridge regression. That solution will always exist. And there's always going to be a value of k where the mean square error ridge coefficients are smaller than the mean square error of the ordinary least squares regression. I've added bias, which makes, makes the errors worse, but I'm reducing the variance, which makes the errors better. So there will be some value of k where the mean square error is smaller. But what value of k? That is where the real difficulty comes in. And uh, I have not found that the ridge regression is my favorite approach to solving these problems because uh, it, I'm always a little bit uncomfortable that I have I done a good job of picking a value of k and have I really reduced the mean square error coefficients or not. It's often very difficult to tell. Uh, we will look at a quick ridge regression in R in the next lecture just so you see how it's done. But instead, I'm going to focus in this class on what I think is the more um, important method of dealing with multicollinearity when you don't want to drop any predictor variables um, just based on the variance inflation factor and you can't add data to break the collinearities. We're going to talk about in an upcoming lecture principal component analysis as our solution. I won't tell you how it's done yet. You'll have to wait until that upcoming lecture a couple of lectures from now. All right, what have we learned in Lecture 51? As always, you should be able to quickly and easily answer these questions. Name as many ways as you can for dealing multicollinearity. When can and can't you solve our multicollinearity problems by collecting new data? When is it wise to drop a correlated predictor variable? And finally, I'd like you to understand the basics of ridge regression, even though it won't be our main technique in this class. Uh, next time, we'll demonstrate some of these concepts and then move on to principal component analysis. Till then.